that, but keep in mind we're going to cover CSS throughout the rest of the term. So when we finish for today talking about CSS, that doesn't mean we're done with CSS. We've just introduced the basic concepts of it, and we'll come back to it, and we'll refine it quite a bit. And um, we went over the, the, the first examples we went over dealt with like the color of the page, um, because that, that typically is the most obvious to, to change. Let me review downloading um, a page uh, from Canvas, downloading an example from Canvas, and um, then we'll build upon it to, to add some more things. So, the examples I put in are in the module for each fold uh, for each week. So, for example, the, the, what we did, and it's usually under the lecture file, so lecture for 831, that's the example we did on 831. Lecture for 92, that's the example we did. Sometimes, especially watching a video, it's difficult to see what I'm doing on the screen, whereas if you download the example, you can sort of follow the example um, on your computer. All right. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to download it. And remember, with a zip file, you have to extract it to, to use it. All right? So if I go in here, it looks like I'm looking at those files. But I'm really not. Those files really aren't there. All right? I have to extract it to really make those real files. All those files have sort of been compressed and put into the one file, which they call a folder, but really isn't a folder. All right? And this will become more critical as we start having more files in our applications, like images and CSS files and so on. So I'm going to click Extract. I'm going to extract to a desktop to a folder called um, WED. And there we go. And if we look now, Notice there's no extract up there, and there's no um, little zipper on the folder. So it's a real folder, and we can work on those. Now, one of the things we're going to do is I'm going to turn on file extensions, again, so that we can see exactly the precise name of each file. Remember that a file name consists of the name plus the extension. And you need the whole thing, really, when you're, when you're doing code with it, because the whole thing forms the name of the file. So this is Windows 7, so I'm going to go up here and say Organize, Folder and Search Option, View, and then I'm going to turn off Hide Extensions for Known File Types. Now in Windows 8 and 10 and other versions of Windows, there's like other ways to do it. Um, the idea is the same, but like exactly where you find the option I think is a little bit different. So if you do a Google um, search for that, you should be able to find it. All right, so I'm going to do that. Now when you look at it, the file names are complete. So we see the whole thing. So we open up Rabbits, and we had something like this. We went and we were able through CSS to change the appearance of the page. And we change the appearance by changing the color. So, I'm going to go into Notepad and look at this again, look at the code, just to review. And up here, you'll notice. In the head section, there's a different tag. There's a style tag. And it is in the head section. So remember, the head section is about information about the page, you know, what it should look like. It's not like actual content that's going to appear within the window. And we separate it from the HTML by putting it in a style tag. That's one way to do it. All right, this is called an embedded style sheet. In other words, the style sheet is right in the page. We're going to learn about external style sheets 
in a bit, maybe end of, end of class today or, or maybe next time or something. But at any rate, that way we'll be able to share the same style between, the same, between different pages. And that's a really good thing, right? Um, one of the fundamental um, notions of design is that things that are the same thing, are of the same significance, mean the same thing, should look the same right so links on our site we may want to look a certain way can you imagine how confusing it would be if on one page of your site your links looked one way and on a different page of your site the links looked a different way and you can apply links are an obvious case but you can apply that to really anything on your site if it looked one way on one page and a different way on another pa way, uh, page um, your users are apt to be confused about just what's, what's going on. So consistency in design is critical. You effectively are sort of teaching people how to understand your pages and how your pages are structured and lay out by having a consistent design where you tell it, hey, my links are blue and underlined. A visited link is magenta and underlined. And then they get to expect that. All right. So consistency is an important design consideration. And one way we can achieve that consistency is by putting the style code in a separate file and then having each page linked to that file. And we'll, we'll get to that um, in, in, a, in a little bit or possibly next time. All right. Style rules consist of two pieces. They consist of the selector then they consist of the style, attributes, and values. You have the selector. Then in these curly braces, you have the name of the attribute, a colon, and then the value for the attribute. Now these are predetermined. In other words, there's a list of what you can use there to control different things. You can't just make stuff up. All right. And the kind of things you can control are virtually everything about the page. The font, the position of things, the color, the border, the space between things. All those things are things that you can control. All right. We're going to start off just by looking at the one area, though, the colors. Two of the colors that you can set are the background and the color itself, the color being the color of the type, the color of the font, the background being the color of the background. So in this case, I made the body of the page, so everything within the body tag gets this rule. The background's color, and the color is blue. Now, for H1, I overruled part of that rule. All right? I've said that for H1s, I want the background to be pink. Now, H1s are still part of the body, right? So really, two rules apply to H1s. The one for the body, because the H1's part of the body, and the one for H1, because the H1's, well, is part of an H1, all right? So this H1 here is in the body. It's also in an H1. That's where the cascading part of cascading style sheets comes in. The more specific a rule def is defined, in other words, the closer to the tag it is, it's going to take precedence. So in this case, because I defined a rule for H1s, the background of pink takes precedence over the background of yellow. However, since I did not define a rule for the color, the font color of the H1s, then it gets this rule. So in that way, it cascades down. And it, it, um, it gets pieces of its rule from two of the rules. Pieces of its appearance from the two rules. Kind of like, um, I'm viewing this in Internet Explorer. Let's view this in Chrome. Kind of like how the font in the footer is red because I said color red. 
at the background it's still yellow because I didn't mention a specific style rule for the background color of the footer. So what are all the things that you can change? Well, we're going to talk about a lot of them in class. Um, if you're in the mood to experiment, W3 Schools has a nice list, has a nice tutorial for it. Learn CSS. Talks about selectors, background, text, fonts, and so on. Background color, you can do either background color or background, and we'll explain, I'll explain later on the difference between the two. But here it shows how you can do a font family to change the font of it, and so on. You can put a border around things. One nice thing about this site is you can try it yourself. If you click this link, it shows you the code, and then it shows you the result over here. And you can play around with it. So, for example, I could say, for this guy, border color red, and I can immediately see the results up there. So it's a good way to, to play around with it and see the capabilities. So there's a lot more to CSS than just changing the colors, but that's going to be our starting point. It's important for us to learn the idea of the selector and the style rule, and we'll go from there. Now, about the colors. The colors I chose simply by, you know, remembering the common color names. Well, what are the HTML color names? Well, there's a, a lot of them, and we can Google them. And here are all the color names that you can use. And there's a lot of them. I, I certainly don't expect anyone to memorize all of these. So I could make that honeydew, the background, let's say. And save this. And there I have that color. All right. Now, do notice that next to, next to the color is this code. And this code is another way of saying that color. So where was honeydew? Here? I could put this in there instead, and I'm going to get the same results. All right. So if I go change it to that, it gives me the same results. That's two ways of saying the same color. I think you should be at least familiar with the basics of how those, how that code works. All right. Because that code isn't just some random numbers. That code, each part of that code has meanings. And you can use knowledge of that code in coming up with all sorts of different colors. In fact, these are the named colors. There's a whole slew of colors that don't have names attached to them. And if we look up HTML color codes, we can see we can select this a bunch of different ways. We can 
click there. This ranges from the light, the lightest, palest to the darkest. I mean, it's almost black. But we could pick this color, let's say, and that's the code for that. If we move it to there, that's the code for that, and so on. Or we can change the shade of it and maybe go for a more green, and it shows the code for that. All right. There's other kinds of charts that you can come up with. Um, that almost look like, um, well, that's the same thing. That almost look like the little uh, paint swatches that you get in, in a store where they have the color and underneath it they have um, the color code. The way the color code works is like this. It's always going to be a six character code. That's mostly true. Sometimes you can get away with three characters if the characters are the same. Like A, A, B, B, C, C. You can show as A, B, C. All right. But at any rate, for the most part, six character codes. And let's look at one of these. Oh, let's make up oh, let's make up one of my own. These hex codes start with a pound sign. So pound sign FF0099. All right. Let's put that in our page and see what we get. So I'll go in, put it on my page, save it, hit refresh, and I get kind of a purple, all right? Kind of a pinkish purple, a very, it's not red, all right? And it's not really purpley, but it's kind of like between red and purple, all right? A hot pink, if you will. Let's see if we can understand how, from this code, how this code translates to that color. These six character codes are really three two character codes. All right. And the first character code stands for how much red is going to be in it. The second character, sta second two characters stands for how much green, and the third stands for how much blue. That's why a lot of times they'll call this RGB, red, green, and blue. So how much of each of those colors we're going to have. So in this case, think of F as being like another number, all right? Uh, a number that's like higher than nine. So for counting in hexadecimal, and these are hexadecimal or base 16, you count. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. So those are the hexadecimal digits. All right, there's 16 of them. That's what hexadecimal means, 16. All right. So the regular digits, or the digits, are the regular digits from 0 to 9, and then A, B, C, D, E, F are the next digits. So F is a high number, is the highest single digit. FF is the highest two-digit number that you can have in hexadecimal. All right? It would be like 99 is in decimal, right? Nine is the highest decimal digit, and we have that in two places, so that would be the highest two-digit number in decimal. Well, FF is the highest two-digit number in hexadecimal. So what that means is the red is turned all the way up. It's maxed out. 
as much red as we can possibly have. How much green do we have in this color? Nothing. No green. That's what the two zeros mean. And blue? Well, we got, we have some blue, but we don't have a lot of blue. All right. We, well, let, let's, let me rephrase that. We have less blue than we have red. So that's why this is sort of a pinkish sort of purple as opposed to a more true purple or a bluish sort of purple. So if I reverse these codes around and I say, Nine nine whoops nine nine zero zero FF I have some red, not max red, but I do have some red, I have no green, and I have maximum blue. So if I were to look at this, then that's maybe a bluer shade of purple. And that doesn't work very good as a background with the blue font. All right. You can come up with virtually any color by mixing red, green, and blue in optics. All right. Keep in mind, for those of you that maybe have done some art, there, there's color lights and there's color pigments. This relates to the light, not the pigments because you get different colors if you, miss, if you mix up red and green paint, for example, compared to red, green, light. All right. So, and you can think of this like having three spotlights, red, green, and blue, that are all focused on, this, on, on a wall, and you can turn each of the spotlights up and down independently. So for example, what would FF0000 be? Red. All right. Red's turned all the way up. That's what the FF means. How much green is there? None. How much blue is there? Nothing. So this would be the purest brightest red that you could have. All right. Now if I made this 9-9, nine, nine, what would this be? It would be less red, so it's going to be a darker red. There we have a darker red. Everything on would be what? There you go with white. All right. If I turned all three of the lights on full blast, that's white. Everything off would be black. If all of them are equal, what color is it going to be? It's going to be some shade of gray, depending on how big the numbers are. If, it's, uh, if I use higher numbers, it's going to be a gray that's close to white. If I use lower numbers, it's going to be a gray that's closer to black. So I go and look at this. There we have a gray, but it's a pretty dark gray. Whereas if I go in something like this, the lighter gray. Now, some of the color mixes aren't necessarily expected. Um, until you get used to them. What if I mix red and green, what am I going to get? You get yellow. All right. I don't know if you expected that or not, but you do. All right. So if I say FF, 
FF00, I have red turned up all the way, green turned up all the way, blue turned up off. So I get yellow. What if I add some blue to this? It's going to be like a paler yellow. All right. You could almost think of it as I'm almost white with the color here because it's almost FFFFFF. It's just that there's a little more red and green, so that gives it a yellowish tint. Yeah. No. no. You can use upper or lower case. Now, here's the good news about this. You could not have understood a single word I've said when I started talking about these codes and you can still use them. All right? Because there's a lot of charts that tell you right off the bat what these things are. And they make sense when you understand like look at this one that is 87963E well the 96 is the biggest number, so we know it's going to be some tint of green. The numbers aren't very high, so it's going to be a darker shade of green. It's not going to be a very bright or light green. All right? And so we can kind of figure out that that makes sense. But you know what? Even if you had no clue about that, if you copy and paste that and put that in your code, you're going to get that shade of green. Likewise this. Now that we know the way these codes work, we know, even if we didn't see it, that's some shade of gray. Because A9, 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 those three codes have the same value. So it's somewhere between black and white. All right. Keep in mind that counting in hex, you would go 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, all the way up through 0, 9, 0, A, 0, B, 0, C, 0, D, 0, E, 0, F. Then you start with 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. All right? Up to 9F. After 9F comes AF. Then, oh, I'm sorry, after, after 9F would come A0, then A1 through AF, then B0 through B. F, and so on down the line. All right? Again, it's good to have at least a basic knowledge of these. Like if you had a color like this, and I put it in my code, And I looked at it and I said, gee, I like that, but I want to make it maybe a little darker. All right. Well, how would I make it darker? Well, I could lower these things. So instead of CA I, or DA, I could make it C9. Instead of F, F I could make it EE. And instead of 9B, I could make it 8A. And when I'm done, that color is going to be similar to it. It's just a notch darker because I lowered those numbers a little bit. All right. If I want to make it more of a pale green, I could make these numbers a little bigger. And I could say... E A F F A C. So I nudged it closer to being pure white by making all the numbers higher, all the other numbers higher. Again, 
If you didn't understand this, which again, I hope you do, because it can come in useful to understand the way these codes work, but at the very least, you can use the chart. Now, the question comes in is, how do I pick colors that go well together? All right. Believe it or not, there's science involved in that. It's not just all personal preference. You know, yeah, there's some people that, you know, you can tell by their clothes, wow, they're really good at matching colors together, and, uh, you know, the outfits they put together look amazing, um, and so on. There's actually some science in that. So, if you're not one of those people that really have a great eye for that, it's still okay, because you can go and you can look at color wheels. Back in the old days, they actually had these little paper cardboard wheels that you would turn and say this red goes with this color and so on. But now it's on the web and we can type in color scheme generator and we can pick one and we can pick go around the color wheel and pick the general shade that we want and it will give us looks like five colors that kind of go together in that shade. There is monochromatic which means just shades of one color. There's trichromatic adjacent three colors or notice that we get a mix of three slightly different colors there is triad three colors tetrad and freestyle where you can just go off the, you know, go off track and make it the way you want. I'm going to stick with monochromatic. Keep it simple. Let's say I want to make my site a shade of green. I could go back and forth and pick it. And then I have these colors. Alright? Now keep in mind that colors, using colors on your web page, um, you don't want overkill. So you might look at this and say there's only five colors. Well, that's true. But keep in mind that you get white and black for free. Right? You can always use white and black. All right? um, and you can probably use any other neutral colors, like, like, like gray colors. You could use those as well. So really, you do have a lot of different choices with that. And you don't want to have overkill where you have a million different colors. All right? Remember, we want to use colors purposefully. We want to use colors to help organize our page and to help our user understand um, what different sections of the page represent and so on. We don't want to just make things colorful just to make them colorful. All right? We want the colors to actually help the users visually organize our page. And therefore, we don't want an overkill of color. I can click on colors Oops. and it shows me the code down here for each of these. So for example, this one is e, E1F4A2. So I could make this E1, F4, A2. And the darkest one is 3, F5100. Zero, zero. All right. 
Let's do something with that pink and red. Let's change the pink to 8A8236. And let's change the red to 637A14. And with a little bit of work, we could probably change those link colors as well. But with a little bit of work, we have a page that looks pretty decent. All right, looks respectable. We're well on our way uh, of having a page where all the colors go well together and so on. And again, I could always use white and black if, uh, you know, could always make the background color of the page white, which I could either represent by the word white or the hex code for white. All right. I'll get students a lot that will say, you know, I don't know about web design, I'm not artistic. All right. And to be sure, people that are artistic might have uh, an advantage for some of these sorts of things. But the good news is, is for the people who aren't artistic, it's not like you're learning how to paint, you know, the Sistine Chapel or something like that. You're just learning how to use colors effectively to communicate a message. So it's less art than the basics of graphic design and visual communications. So by using these resources, you can like fake that part of it. All right. And for people who are strong in that area, well, that gives them a chance to, to use those skills. Web development is a sort of a mix between the design aspect and the technical aspect. And the nice thing is, is, you know, you come with a certain set of strengths, but as far as your weaknesses go, you can learn enough about those to sort of compensate and, and get by using that. Now, the last thing I'd like to do today is I'd like to put uh, an image on this page. All right. So, we're going to assume that the image is in the same page, same folder as the code. So I have two pictures of my rabbits here. I'm going to put them in the same folder as my code, and I'm going to put an image on my page. All right. First one we're going to put is a Flemish giant, so we're going to put the image here in this section. The image tag is the IMG tag. All right. And like the link, we have to give more information about the tag. Like, what image do we want to show here? All right, what's the name of the file that we want to show here? Because any website can have hundreds, thousands of different images. Well, which one do we want to show here? So therefore, just like the A has an href attribute, the image has a source attribute. And if the file is in the same folder as the HTML document, you simply put in the file name. So in this case, they're all in the same folder, so I just put in the file name, including the extension. Keep in mind, this is definitely one area where it's important to know the extension, because if you don't know, uh, an image file could be one of a various different types. It could be a GIF file, it could be a PNG file, it could be a JPEG file. 
Even with a JPEG file, it could have the JPG extension or JPEG extension. So therefore, you want to know the precise name of the file. And in this case, by showing the extension, we see it is JPG. Now, there's another attribute that we're going to put in here. And this is relevant most when we talk about people accessing our web page via a screen reader. A screen reader is a, pay, is a, is a piece of uh, software that actually narrates the screen to the user and it's used by people that are blind or otherwise visually impaired. And that is the alt attribute. And the alt attribute is a brief description of what the picture is. Now, with an image tag, there's no start and end image tag. Actually, we could put it in. But there's never going to be anything between the start and end image tag. So you can either leave off the end image tag, or you can do this which is what I usually do. And that's a shorthand that says this is a starting and an ending image tag all rolled into one. Now the dwarf rabbit. File name was dwarf.jpg. All right. Now when we save this, those images should appear on the screen. There we go. Dwarf one doesn't. Why not? Dwarf.jpg. Org. Yeah, those are way too big. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, my suggestion is I would not scale them via HTML or CSS. I'd scale them in a photo editor. Okay. All right. So, um, any number of photo editors would work for this, even plain old Microsoft Paint. Now one thing I would suggest though, is to make a copy of your image first. Alright? Because if I take an image and make it smaller, and I don't have a copy of it, if I decide, wait, that's too small, I want to make it bigger, I can never make a smaller image bigger again. I've lost that information and the quality of the picture will suffer a lot. I can make a big image smaller without losing sharpness. So what I would do is I would copy these somewhere. I'll copy them to the desktop. Then I'm going to go into Microsoft Paint. And I'll go in and try to remember how you do this in Microsoft Paint. I'll make it maybe 20% of its size. There we go. And I'll save. And I'll do the same thing with this one. So I have a backup. If, I, if this turns out to be too small, I can always go back to the backup and, and do it again. But the pages, or the pictures now are probably of a more um, appropriate size. Any questions at this point? 
Yeah. I know that that is huge. I would not put dashes in an alt attribute. Uh, it should it should be an English it should be an English phrase, okay. sentence, whatever. Because again, a screen reader is going to read it. A screen reader sees those dashes. I don't know how a screen reader is going to react to that. All right. Keep in mind the main reason you use it. It may have benefits for search engine um, uh, it related things, but the main reason you use the alt attribute is for accessibility and for people that um, are visually impaired. All right, questions? All right, we'll see, I'll go, question? All right, we'll see. I believe so.